truths that I could think about is that first, our world is getting smaller. In the advent of technology, social media, you know, mobile devices, what used to take years and months only takes seconds and minutes. And what used to take days only takes milliseconds. Technology has drawn us together, making our own world smaller. The second truth is that our world is getting bigger. What used to be lives constrained in a single city now is a life that's filled with opportunities around the world. What could have been a life that's, you know, in the four walls of a room or four walls of a house is now a life that's way beyond the boundaries of what could have been and what should have been, but what is and what will be. Our world is getting bigger because our world is getting smaller. The third truth I'd like to think about is that our small, big world is in danger. As an environmental scientist, I am very much aware of the many dangers and the many problems that come with uh, uh, global warming, yes, and climate change. I love climate change because it's also an alliteration. But, uh, you know, this, there's this really, really great quote from Barack Obama. I know some people have their reservations for the guy, but he has this wonderful quote that we need to really think about. We are the first generation to feel the effects of climate change and the last generation who can do something about it. That rings very true. We are the last generation to actually make a difference so that we, there would be a different result, a different world, not the doomed world that, all, that a lot of scientists are looking at. We are actually looking at within 2050, we're going to run out of coal, oil, many other amenities that we're enjoying today. And this will not happen if we only do, and if you only conserve, if you only would make a change. What defines a generation is not what? It's not the, it's not the fashion, not the technology, and not the lingo. No, that's not what defines your generation. What defines a generation is its prevailing culture. The 1970s was defined by people who loved to hug trees. And the 1980s were you know, defined by people who liked long hair and rocking out. The 19, 1990s was defined by boy bands and bubblegum pop. The 2000s, the 2010s, the generation defined with self-centeredness, selfish desires, and me. We are the me generation. Our technology, our fashion is all catered towards us. The selfie cam, the selfie stick, the selfie talk, the selfie social media, that's all about us. What we care about most is not the rest of the world. What we care about most is us. To cultivate a culture that concerns, we need to cultivate a culture that cares. Why? Because the thing about it is, if we only care more than just what's in our, you know, more than just us, we can actually create a difference. You can actually stand up for something that's way more than our own selfish desire and to have the best you know, status post of our friends have the most likes and to have the most hearts in Instagram. So I have here three questions that I always ask myself. A lot of you are student leaders, right? A lot of you are actually involved in so many social, you know, social, uh, cultural, cultural, social cultural activities. A lot of you are very inclined with being you know, student leaders and being that person who makes a difference in society. But I want you to ask, I want to ask three things from you. And these three things are what I also constantly ask myself. First, do you have an idea that would benefit humanity? A lot of you say, yes, yes, I have such a great idea. I want to, you know, it's, it's something that I really want to do. It's really something that I really want to share and just really want to tell the world. Second question, are you willing to do whatever it takes to share that idea? A lot of you would say, yes. I'm willing to quit my course so I could you know, create you know, these things or I, could, you know, I want to move to another country so I could share these ideas. The last question I think is the most important question is if someone, someone more eloquent and charismatic than you would share the same idea to a wider audience but will not give you credit, are you fine with it? Some people would say, and a lot of people in fact, would stop there and say, huh, Maybe not. Why? Because that's what you're thinking and what you're feeling is not altruism. You actually want validation and recognition under the guise of altruism. You don't really care 
about other people. You don't really care about the rest of the world. You care about yourself first and foremost, and you want people to want you and love you simply because you seem like you care. That's not the kind of generation we need, especially with this time and age. Next. I started this, uh, The Great ASEAN Eco Debates. It's a project I did um, a few years back. And the goal of this project was uh, to establish a debate tournament, an international debate tournament across the great uh, across the ASEAN countries, in hopes of having college students. You know, I'm, okay. So I'm a college debater. When I was in college, I used to debate competitively. And then when I got when I graduated after college, I still joined tournaments. But I realized one thing I realized in the, these debate tournaments is that when you get to these tournaments and you get to those rooms and it's so fired up, everybody's just so good, so good with talking and those amazing ideas. But once they leave the room, it's all gone. Like all of them, they just forget about those ideas. So like, you know, and then you're standing right behind them, like, oh, that was an amazing idea. I said, oh, I forgot about it. Okay, let's move to the next round. And I, I don't blame them for it because that's not necessarily their goal. Their not goal is to change the world. Their goal is to win a tournament. But for me, who wants to change you know, things up and like, you can share that to some people and they would actually do it. And so I started this program, this the Great ASEAN Eco Debates. Fortunately, you know, the U.S. Department of State they gave us uh, a grant. Um, they gave us uh, a good amount of money to actually start it. And um, what we were supposed, what we were going to do was, and what we are trying to do continuously, is to have the tournament, and while they're talking, while these debate tournaments, the debaters are actually talking, we gather up their information, and we, you know, we type it out and share it to everyone else. And that's how we want to convert the conversation to conservation. But you know, that's not just how you should do that. That's not, that's not just the only part of the thing. We can actually do a lot more. And for your own personal advocacies, you can also convert your conversations to conservations. How are you going to do that? First, first is to let your ego go. Why? Next. We need to let go and listen. Someone might have something better to say. Right? Because first and foremost, next slide, sometimes the best conversations don't have to include you. Right? It, it, it just let a conversation happen and listen to it. Because sometimes you're not in the spotlight. It doesn't have to be you in the spotlight. The problem I have with so many student leaders is that they won't do a project if they're not on the podium. They won't do anything, they won't make change if they're not up in the spotlight, up center stage. I mean, some people are just meant to be there in the center stage. Some people are just meant to be in the background. But it doesn't have to be you all the time. Because that's the best way conversations would happen, is to let it happen, regardless if you're part of it or not. Next. It's what? It's to categorize contributors. The problem with a lot of people is, they're, you know, especially when you're, you watch debaters, they don't have much love for the environment. They want to win. And but they have the brains and the idea to do it. But then you see these people who are willing to do and really to change the world, but they may not have the best ideas. So the principle of the eco-debates was this, simple enough. It's to let thinkers think, to let doers do, but make them communicate. Why? Because if people who have the ability to come up with great ideas get to talk with people who are willing to do these great ideas, change will happen. Conversations will happen and it will convert, be converted into conservation. Because if people who think, keep on thinking and they will never talk with people who are willing to do stuff, those thoughts will only remain thoughts. And those people who are willing to do stuff but will not talk with people who have the great ideas that they, you know, can help them, will do stuff that won't make a difference. Because you need to have the people who have great ideas talk with the people who are willing to do them so that these ideas might become a reality. The third one is this. Make matter matter. So here's a question. Next slide. One plus one equals, so a lot of people would think it's like two. If you're not good at math, you think it's three, you think it's four. And then some people would say apple. Some people say cow, some people say potato. Now, most people, most rational people would always answer two, three, or four. Why? 
because they have context. They know that the question is looking for a number, not a potato, not a fruit, not an animal. That's the same with conversations. If you don't have context, if you don't have matter, your conversation will be shallow, your conversation will be for naught. That's why in the eco debates, we had a special feature in this debate tournament. Next slide. We had special speakers. These people gave the debaters information about the topics. These debaters are thinking tools, thinking machines that can come up with great ideas. But these people have the information that they can use to think and process. You have people from WWF, people from Save Philippine Seas, people from the Climate Change Commission. These people make matter matter because it matters. Information is key and once and beautifully processed information makes into wonderful solutions. Next. The fourth one is this. Be friends with failure. Why? Because first and foremost, failure does not destroy roads to success. It only eliminates wrong ones. A few days ago, someone sent me an email telling me that I humiliated the whole department because I had a really bad presentation in a conference. At first, I was so pain, it was painful for me. It was painful and I never felt anything like that. I, I, I stupidly emailed her back with still my emotions heightened up, telling her that, you know, this is what I signed up for, right? Objectivity. And what's objectivity, what's objectivity if not void of emotions and sensitivity? You know, that's, that's not the right thing to say. And in fact, she made it clear to me that what she meant, what she meant was, although said in a very mean way, was that, let's not do this again. Let me fail this time, but we're going to get better because failure does not stop you from actually succeeding. It only takes away the wrong detours of your road. It just leads you even better. What's better about failure is that it leads you to the, to the right road. It narrows down your options. So with the eco debates, we've only had one year of it. We're trying to have a second one. Um, and hopefully, you know, it, it will happen. But this time, I'm focusing on something for me is bigger, but for a lot of people is smaller. Next slide. The last thing about it is we want to go beyond the bonga. From what uh, our first speaker said, for our first speaker said, said that, you know, sometimes it's in the little things. And for me, I went from going international debate tournament to going to the classroom. Because I feel like the change is actually there. And I get to talk to students, hopefully change their lives. Someone told me that they joined Red Cross because of the class. And uh, you know, that kind of change is not just this. You know, it's not just going to be as short as this. That kind of change can last for a lifetime. Next slide. Oftentimes, the best conversations that happen are happen off stage. Because in that case, you know, it's it's organic, it's intimate, it's real. And it happens, especially in the classroom, it happens over the course of a semester. To close, um, and during my final exam, I actually asked my students, at the last page of your test paper, write your biggest dreams about the environment. And one student, one very noisy student, decided to write this. He said, I want to paint on a very big canvas. At first, I was like, okay, that's weird. But he's a, he's, a, he's a fine art student. And then after reading it again and again and again, I realized how profound it really is. Because this person has been painting the rest of his life on canvases big or small. But this time, he wants to paint on a very, very big canvas. That's us. We've been talking, we've been conversing for the rest of our lives, talking to different people of different shapes and sizes. But what are we doing? Are we conversing and finding avenues to paint a bigger can on a bigger canvas? Or are we just settling on the little petty talks of life? We need to convert our conversations to conservation. And our concern and our conversations have to be those little paintbrushes painting a very big picture on a very big canvas. Thank you so much.
And uh, salamat at sa kalitupang hapon.